I'll go tell the folks. Do you know what to expect for Is anyone on? started. My name is Ellen Solaris. I'm the current president of the Minnesota Public Health Association and I am very excited to be here with you all for our third policy forum of the year. They've been good ones so far and I'm really looking forward to this conversation and our panelists. I will add that as I am almost ending my term as president, that means that nominations are open for our governing council. You can find that information on our website. So president, treasurer, secretary, like anything, if you're interested in having a leadership role and getting more involved with MPHA, um, it's really been a wonderful experience for me and for lots of folks I know. So all the encouragement for people to do that as we always start our MPHA events. I'm going to read our ancestral land statement. This can be found on the agenda, and it also can be found on our website as well. We ask that you take a moment to honor and acknowledge that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe. Indigenous people have a long-standing history and connection to the land since time immemorial and are the original stewards of lands and waters. Many American Indians were forcibly exiled from their lands because of aggressive and persistent settler colonialism and United States governmental policies, but they persevered. Who make this acknowledgement to honor the Dakota and Anishinaabe people, ancestors and descendants, as well as the land itself. And I will add that I live and work on the ancestral homelands of the Lafcoot. All right, before I introduce our moderator, we do have a raffle for some Starbucks gift cards. So I'm gonna start with that. I'll do one now and I'll do two at the end. Who has the closest birthday to today? Today being March 24th. Yeah? Is today your birthday? No, March oh. 31st. 
March 31st? Yeah. That's my son's birthday. Oh, is anyone else closer? Sorry. I got excited about. Anyone else in March? When's your birthday? March 1st. March 1st. Oh. You looked so excited, I thought maybe your birthday was today. But I was going to be really excited that you were joining us for your birthday. Oh, gosh. <laughs> All right. So, I am going to introduce our moderator, Jean Streeter. Jean is retired from Washington County Department of Public Health and Environment, where she worked as a health educator and public health program manager for 19 and a half years. That was my second career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I admire that commitment. Um, <laughs> your first career, right, was in teaching and coaching all over Minnesota. <laughs> She's worked at Mankato State, St. Joseph's Hospital in Mankato, St. Cloud Catholic Charities. Shout out to St. Cloud, that's where I'm from. Um, Jean is active in the Minnesota Public Health Association and is the secretary for the Minnesota Society of Public Health Education. She's been a certified health education specialist since 2003. And is a key and vital member of this policy forum committee as well. Jean, I'm going to pass it over to you. Great. Thank you. So thank you and good morning. Uh, it looks like we have a little bit of spring peeking out at us. Uh, hopefully in the next few weeks we'll have some more. I know there are a lot of people that are on spring break, so maybe they took off uh, for warmer climates. Um, welcome also, not only to the people that are here in person, but I think we have a lot of people on the live stream. So uh, thanks to Mary and her assistance with our virtual and in-person events. Um, we really uh, morphed from you know just one way of doing this programming and hopefully we can be reaching out to more people uh, by doing this. I also want to thank the forum committee up front for their great work. So some of you may know that I was on the other side of this podium for about 12 years on the forum committee. And I appreciate being invited back <laughs> to continue to participate. Um, Angie Carlson is not here today, unfortunately, and she has been the longtime chair uh, for this committee. Uh, and she's been working uh, alongside of Lindsay Fabian and Leah Berg, who's out at the registration table, and now Kathleen Norlin has joined the group. Um, and we can't forget Bonnie, who is Lindsay's mom, who has always been a key person. Um, we have to thank those moms, right? Because they get us to where we're going. Right, Lisa? <laughs> so the format for today uh, will be the following, and you have uh, the agenda uh, on your tables. Um, in a few moments, you're going to be hearing from uh, the panelists that we've gathered here. Uh, we see that there's still one person that's absent. Maybe they'll be showing up. That would be great. Uh, we have some great thoughts and comments that will be coming from uh, both of the people that are here. We'll hear uh, their opening remarks, and we'll follow it up with a little bit of discussion. Then we're going to turn it over to you to talk at your tables about what you've heard and come up with some questions that you would like to ask the panelists. Those of you that are live streaming, we welcome your comments and your questions as, as well. You can message us on uh, Facebook Live and Mary will be monitoring those. We'll then have a question and answer time with the panelists and wrap up the session with any final announcements from MPHA. There are some exciting things coming up besides nominations and elections. And uh, to respect everybody's time, we'll make sure that we're out of here by 9.30. Um, please feel free to stick around if you are able to do some networking. It's something we haven't been able to do in quite some time. Um, and that's an important piece of being part of this organization. So just a few opening comments to get us rolling here today. 
none of us have to go too far to be exposed to the safety concerns in our neighborhoods, schools, and public places. There are mounting reports every day of tragic events and more that we probably don't hear about. It creates trauma, weariness, anxiety, fatigue. I know right now I think I have media fatigue, fear, possibly anger, and feeling unsafe does not build a healthy community. In a recent Star Tribune article reporting on the most current Minnesota student survey results, young people continue to feel unsafe at school. The writer stated, our kids are frightened, depressed, and confused. Increased mental health issues and addictive behaviors also put our youth at risk for injury or worse. In our communities, there's a lot of discussion about public safety, what's the role of police, and their behaviors. And in the judicial system, the question of fairness and liberty is debated. The issues are right in front of us. And being in that field of public health, we have the opportunity to play a significant role in injury prevention. But I'm wondering today if we can adopt a beginner's mind, something that I've been reading about lately. Being open, not disillusioned, or overly cautious or fearful as we take in what the panel has to share with us today on this topic. So you will be able to find the full bios of the speakers today on the website. And um, is there a little QR code on, on the uh, agenda today that you can, uh, that'll take you right to it. But I'm just gonna give a few snippets from their great bios uh, as means of introduction. So Lisa Clemens is a retired Minneapolis police sergeant and the founder of A Mother's Love Initiative a boots-on-the-ground grassroots organization that she founded in 2014 to give leadership and a voice to African Americans. The group was recently mentioned on a KSTP story about Operation Endeavor and their role with Minneapolis police. Uh, we'll be providing a link to that and hopefully to your website because there's a lot of other great things uh, that are posted there. I also really like the motto that the group has put together. Save the mother, you save the child. Save the father, you save the family. Save the family, you save the community. So welcome to Lisa, and we're anxious to hear about what you have to say. Um, Representative Frazier is not here yet. Um, he, I'm sure, is very busy at the legislature. So uh, if he pops in, we'll try to include him uh, and get his thoughts and ideas. He is a fellow uh, Maverick, a Minnesota State <laughs> Mankato <laughs> University graduate, so uh, as am I, and I wanted to welcome him to the stage, uh, but maybe we can connect later. He also has a similar degree as my husband, so I want to know if they've ever crossed paths. And then we have Mark Osler, who is a Robert and Marion Short Professor of Law at the University of St. Thomas with us today. Along with being a gifted teacher, Osler's writing on clemency, sentencing, and narcotics policy has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and law journals from nine different schools. So we welcome your perspectives today. I think we will uh, open with um, Lisa representing the community for your remarks. And um, you've got about five, seven minutes, and um, we've got plenty of time this morning, so we'll have good discussion and good input. So I'll turn it over to you, Lisa. Thank you. So my name is, can you hear me? <coughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so my name is Lisa Clemens. I am the founder of a Mother's Love Initiative. Uh, I am a retired sergeant from the Minneapolis Police Department. 
And I always like to say uh, in this time that I am unapologetic about that. I now run this organization in the community and it started out focusing on the voices of women, especially African American women and mothers. What I found when I was in the police department and once I came out into the community, the voice that was never at a table was the African American mother. When you talk about 70 or more percent of households being headed by single parents, that's usually mothers, and especially in the African American community. What I always heard was that uh, they had to save black men and black boys, forgetting that we birth them and we raise them. And not just black women, women of all races have black children. So we should have voices at the table and that was not happening. When I started this organization in 2014, it was as if every time I went to sit in a chair at the table, the chair was moved. So I had to bring my own chair to the table. Y'all know how that is. But um, by 2018, that was the very first time we received funding to do any work in the community. And that was by the Chief of Police, uh, Madeira Arredondo, and Deputy Chief Art Knight. They called me on the phone and said, is a mother's love ready to go? I said, we've been ready since 2014. Where do you need us? And we, they needed us to come into downtown Minneapolis to address the mental health issues that were happening down there, the homeless issues, young girls downtown to midnight, one, two in the morning, with kids and strollers, and just to be a presence as women and mothers in the downtown area. So that was the first opportunity we got to show people the importance of having mothers out in the community. When I say mothers, I recognize all women as mothers. I don't care if you birth a child or not. You have mothered a child in some way or another. So when we started working, we didn't stop. Now we have uh, 23 women working with us. We have men working with us because we realized that if you wanted to affect change, you had to be inclusive. So we work with a village mentality. So every time something's happening, I go right on Facebook. I don't know if any of you are on Facebook, for, but I go right on Facebook and I ask my village for help. That, that's the way I see things. I ask my sisterhood for help. Sisterhood for me does not have a race. And it does not mean you are uh, surgically um, or birth a woman. When I say sisterhood, I'm inclusive. I mean sisterhood. But we started doing this work out here and I realized being out here, people really don't get it. it the view is different on the ground than it is from the window above or the office. In the winter time, we believe <clears throat> everything stops in Minneapolis in the winter time. Absolutely untrue. We're still dealing with the violence, the conflict, still interrupting those cycles. The difference now is it's everywhere. Before it was contained in North Minneapolis. And after the murder of George Floyd, I know people get sick of hearing uh, the use of George Floyd's name, because I really am. People have to be held accountable and stop holding uh, George Floyd as the reason for the misbehaviors that are happening, for the criminal activity that's happening in our community. But the reference point for a lot of people is the murder of George Floyd. Since that time, crime has grown to a point that the floodgate has opened and it's, not, no, it's no longer just North Minneapolis. It is citywide and it is moving into other cities within our state. One of them is a question on here, so I'll, I'll stop at that. But I think the schools have, have issues. The community has issues. Policy makers has issues. Right now, we're focused on public safety as police reform. That is not the biggest problem we face in the black community. I'm real when I talk. That is not. And that is why the initiative to abolish or dismantle didn't pass because the black community recognized that the violence is not just us as suspects, but it's us as victims. So last year, 71% uh, 
of the shooting victims were us and the ages of the suspects and the victims was between 12 and 26. That was half the pie that people who look like me were a part of that violence. So I'm unapologetic and I'm not embarrassed to say we need help and we need work in our community because just like cancer is bullets. And that's what we're seeing right now. One thing is that we're not a balanced panel because we're both from law enforcement. So, uh, you know, my own background is that after law school, I went back to my my home of Detroit and uh, worked as a federal prosecutor there. And in fact, I my, began my career in law as a process server in Detroit, and then uh, went back there as a prosecutor in the '90s, um, which was a pretty fascinating time to be a prosecutor. And I learned a lot. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, you know, violent crime and where we perceive that it comes from because there's been this narrative that most of us kind of accept, which is that economic downturns cause a rise in violent crime. That's, that's, that's something most people are going to accept. And that idea comes from the Great Depression. You know, during the Great Depression, you had a rise in crime. Um, straight across the board. But the truth is that since then, we've had a number of things that have happened that really challenge that easy narrative, that economic downturn causes violent crime. Um, you know, for example, we saw a sharp rise in violent crime from the 70s through the 90s, the mid-90s. Um, and that didn't correlate to a, a big downturn in crime. Um, we saw a long-term decrease in violent crime from the 1990s to about 2019. Um, it went down, 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 down. And in fact, some of it's really striking. Homicides in Manhattan during that time period went down 91%. 91%. That's, I mean, something went really right during that period. Then right in the middle of it, what do we have? The Great Recession from 2008 to 2009. So we had this real economic downturn, a lot of unemployment, but crime kept going down. And then, um, you know, think about the pandemic. The pandemic, we saw poverty rates go down, in part because of government support of people. And so um, poverty rates went down, and we still had this rise in crime. And so what we do see in each of those periods where we see crime going up is some kind of dislocation, some kind of shock to the system. Something, you know, in the pandemic it was pretty easy to see that kids aren't in school and families are disrupted. And, you know, people who normally are going off to work, they're at home and they're having conflicts with people in the home. And, you know, this is what we saw in communities whether it was black, white, urban, rural. And we saw a rise in crime during the pandemic and after the pandemic that was across the board. Red states, blue states, cities, small towns, suburbs, rural areas, we saw violent crime go up. And so there's something, and you know, one of the things that people got hung up on was that the crime going up in their city was because of something somebody in their city did. You know, that uh, in San Francisco, it was Chesa Boudin's fault. Or here, it was, you know, because of George Floyd. Or, you know, all these things. And every city seemed to have its own local excuse for why violent crime went up. But it went up everywhere. And what everywhere had in common was the pandemic, was this public health crisis. 
And that's what really happened. And when we look at communities like mine and yours, the same thing happened, which is that you had people, all of a sudden, their situations were different. And it might not have been that they lost a job or you know, weren't able to make rent, but the social structure was challenged by the pandemic. Um, and that, that really is something that I think is gonna change the way we think about violent crime because it's not just about economics, it's about deeper things too. And when we need to recognize them, if we're going to address it, we need to talk about the kinds of things that Lisa's talking about. Um, and it's not just about, about economics and who's rich and who's poor and how the whole system is doing economically. Um, there's, a, there's a social component that cuts across all those lines that affected almost every community. Now, one thing that's interesting is that in the wake of the pandemic, we've seen differential outcomes, that some places have seen a reduction in crime and others haven't as much. And so it's important to look at what happened in those different kinds of communities. Now, in most places, what we're seeing now is we move further away from the pandemic and things stabilize within families and communities, we're seeing less crime and especially less violent crime. There are some things that are, are going up it's episodic, you know, for example, car theft here. Um, but I do want to, I want to make two points. And one is, what do we do about violent crime regardless of where it comes from? And, and again, this is going to be wonky, but I have, I have strong opinions about this. And, and, you know, while Lisa has been working with Operation Endeavor, um, I was working with a lot of the same people in Heels 2.0. And one of the things that I really pushed for with Andy Luger and other people was to focus on two things uh, as we were addressing violent crime. And it's based on a really simple hypothesis. It's not a hypothesis, it's a truth. Which is that violent crime is committed by relatively few people and they tend to do it more than once. In other words, other than um, you know, kind of some one-off murders, we tend to see the same people, and it's a relatively small group of people in any community, who commit multiple violent crimes. And that means that if we can incapacitate those people, we're gonna make an outsized difference in addressing violent crime. And there's two specific things you can do to do that. Execute outstanding warrants and raise the clearance rate for violent crimes. If you can do those two things, solve more violent crimes, particularly homicides, and uh, and, and execute the outstanding warrants, you're going to incapacitate more of that crucial core group of people who are committing the crimes. And that, and that didn't happen during the pandemic because what happened was uh, as the Minneapolis Police Department and other police departments shrunk after the pandemic, one of the things, and I'm sure with your experience, you know this, once, once a police department starts to shrink, especially quickly, they have to go to a core function, which is respond to 911 calls, right? <laughs> and so, all of a sudden, no matter what your job was before, now you're in a squad car responding to 911 cars because one of the primary evaluators for police departments is response time to 911. And they're gonna let that slip, but they can't let it slip too far. And so what are, what's, what are people being pulled away from when they do that? Solving crimes which is the clearance rate, and executing outstanding warrants. And so when the police department had this shock to its system and reduced in size, they pulled away and they, they weren't able to perform the two functions that matter the most for restricting violent crime, which is executing the warrants for people we've already charged and going out and, and solving more of the crimes. Um, you know, they're getting better at that, and that's something that Operation Endeavor um, you know, Mike Radmer and, and people like that that I've worked with who, who really have focused on these two things and tried to get others to focus on those two things. But there, 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 really, there really are solutions to some of these, these problems that are fairly simple, but hard to do because the metrics of success that we have for police departments and things sometimes steer us in the other direction. Um, so that's it. I think I've... I've used more than my seven minutes.
opening comments from both of you. Thank you. I think this will spur further discussion uh, between us here right now for the next few minutes, as well as the table discussion. Um, and uh, by the way, we did get a message on Facebook that someone reported that the uh, host was in session until like 5 a.m. this morning, so I don't know that Representative uh, Frazier will be able to make it today. Um, just kind of going back to a couple of things, Lisa, that you alluded to and um, Mark as well, about uh, the dropping crime rates and yet uh, some of the reports from the, or I should say in the metro area, Minneapolis uh, specifically, but some of the suburban areas. I know Bloomington has been on the news quite a bit lately for some of the activity at the Mall of America and um, other kinds of activity um, in their community. Uh, do you have a comment about you know, when crime goes down in one area, does, is it simply being pushed someplace else? I don't think it's really being pushed. I think it's always been there. We just haven't been paying attention because the media's focus is always on the bigger cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. And I think what people also miss is they're all connected. These are all the same kids. You, you just alluded to that. These are all the same kids. So the kids out at uh, the Mall of America, they come from where? St. Paul? Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn South, Minneapolis. So they're all the same, but one of the things I wanted to add to him, he said fewer people doing the crime more than once. The problem with that is they always pull another kid in. They always pull another person in. So it will continue to grow, especially now with a system of slapping wrist versus actually having some real plans and ideas for dealing with this and being able to do it together. But these are all the same kids. Just so you know, they're all the same kids. Yeah, one, one thing about that sense, I noticed that, that James, you talked about it, you talked about the Minneapolis in terms of data, that we see the rates going down, and then you talked about Bloomington in terms of what we see in the media. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a really, so you're, you're comparing apples and oranges. And that's one of the real problems we have with this as a whole, is that people perceive crime based on what they see on next door. <laughs> you know, I like, uh, is crime going up? Yes, it is. I read about this guy. Well, that's that's not data. That's data. That, you know, that's one. You're basing your opinion from one data point, uh, and and we do a lot of that. And the problem with that, there's a couple problems with that. And one of them is that if you start looking at what the media picks out, it is racially biased. And that's part of the problem. That it, you're gonna think that we have a problem that's just in Minneapolis and always has been. Um, and another problem is that it's not realistic. And <laughs> you know, we see these crimes that, uh, you know, I couldn't understand the fascination with the, the Murdoch case. Um, you know, the, the one that was front page news all over the place. Because, you know, again, that's a single data point. And meanwhile, we've got this whole network of issues that connects to many, many, many deaths that we're not addressing. And so it's important to compare data to data as opposed to data to what I read on Next Door Neighbor. Great, thank you. Um, there was a question coming from the committee about other countries and their surveillance of their citizens and uh, the link to any kind of um, deterring of crime. Um, do you have any comments on our system compared to others that you see? Well, I don't think we want to be China or Singapore. Um, you know, that, that we do have rights to privacy that don't exist in, in these other regimes. And so you have to be pretty careful about that. The other thing, too, is that already the amount of video that law enforcement has access to is exponentially greater than we saw 20 years ago. You know, stuff from ATM cameras, poll cameras, from body-worn officer cameras. And so we, we have a lot more of that. Now, one thing I, I will say is, is I'm an advocate for using cameras strategically. 
And I'll tell you a story. So our catalytic converter got stolen from our 2004 Honda Odyssey van. <laughs> and, and I got really mad about that. Uh, so I, 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 one of the things I really believe in is that, that you can uh, sweep up a thousand thieves or you can get one fence. And so I did some research to find out who was selling or who was buying all these catalytic converters. And I found out they were mostly going to one place, Metro Metals, which um, has a, a, a storefront that where they just buy catalytic converters. And so I went and parked in front of it and watched for a while and took some video of it and then went over and, and, uh, and I won't, because it's, they're working on it, but I went and talked to some people about it. Um, and, you know, and one of the things that, that I always suggest in a situation like that is put a pole camera up across the street. You know, you want to see where these are going, that's, that's in public space, you can watch. In real time, as people are walking up and, and selling their catalytic converters to this one storefront. Um, so I think in terms of using that kind of technology strategically, it's important to do. And we need to do more of it. And we need to be, in, and especially in places where we know these things are happening. Um, but I, I sure don't want to see us become intrusive the way that you know, China is. So let me just go here. I think every house, I think the city, the federal government, everybody should give every house a ring camera. And, and I'll tell you why I think that. In these times when crime is violent out there, people are afraid to say something. But if it's already on tape and they can aid law enforcement without you feeling like you have to put your own life at risk, um, I think we should have cameras to do that. But to just have a camera just because I probably would be opposed to that because I'd be doing the most sometimes out there. All right, thank you. Um, we've talked quite a bit about uh, the community and next door and all these kinds of things. But um, can we turn our attention to um, schools in particular, uh, which is part of our topic today? Um, are there some things that you feel that schools could be looking at a little bit closer um, or you know I, I think some of these situations point to a larger uh, problem you know that might be in the community but it's brought into the schools um, what might be some methods of addressing this a big part is knowing the players so you said it right, that whatever happens in the community will make its way into the school. There's no getting around that. Uh, uh, a rule of thought is on site. So what that means in the community is whatever that beef is that we have, when I see you, it's on site. I'm going to retaliate on site and I don't care who is in that vicinity. I'm coming for you if I gotta shoot through everybody in here to get you, I'm coming for you. That's just the mentality. And that those fights and arguments, hard and high is an example of that, where it comes right into the schools. When I talk to teachers, I feel sorriest for teachers because they never give up on our kids. But we continue to make them unsafe. So a lot of what, I'll get these text messages early in the morning, about all the guns and knives that are taken off students in the schools. And I still can't figure out why teachers aren't um, supported enough that they can come and say, we don't feel safe. We're not trying to quit our jobs or leave these kids or abandon our schools or our communities, but we don't feel safe. So I do think that bringing parents into the schools. Like I didn't think Harding High should have reopened without having parents of those students who were in the halls all the time, not going to class, without them coming into that space, sitting down and talking about how they can help yeah. make the school safe. I don't care if you guys search your kid backpack before they go to school, I really don't care. But I do think that the schools have to start to reopen and invite people from the community in that these young kids know that they respect. Uh, like the coaches, you, you know, when you're, your kids 
They respect coaches in the park, coaches in the schools, but if somebody's mom or dad is working in the school, most of the kids in the community know them and they'll go, oh no, that's AJ's dad. You know what I mean? Man, don't be talking like that to AJ's mom. Something like that. But there has to be some familiarity in the school for young people. But our teachers have to be made safe before you can do anything else. Yeah, and it just this is saying the same thing in a different way, but almost across the board with law enforcement, one of the things that is often lacking is, is, um, this is gonna come off the wrong way, but uh, intelligence in the sense of information gathering, you know, like the CIA, <laughs> that kind of intelligence. In other words, too rarely is there anyone in a school who can discern what you're talking about? Because teachers know it, but they can't do much about it. You've got social workers, but their job is connecting people to services. I'm from a family of social workers. I know all about that. Um, you've got administration, but they don't get down to the ground level of hearing what the students are saying to each other. You might have police officers even, but they're standing watching people walk by. They're not interacting with the kids. And what you don't have in that situation is that person who has the intelligence in terms of the information to disrupt the violence that's going to happen. You don't have a Pharrell Brown in the school. And so I'm mentioning this guy, Pharrell Brown, who we both know. And he's a legendary violence interrupter in, in North Minneapolis, Brooklyn Center, that area. And I've been to his office, and I went in, met with him, I walked out, and his, his lobby of his office is just full of kids waiting to come in to talk to him. And he's somebody who knows in a specific community what the next thing to happen is going to be. And that's what we don't have in schools, is there's nobody whose job it is to do that. And where the reflexive thing we think is, okay, there was violence, let's send in a police officer. Well, people aren't gonna to talk to a police officer in uniform about what's really going on. Um, and if we leave it to people like coaches, that's not their job either. Um, and so we have to be, as with everything else, we have to be creative in thinking, who are the people in the schools that have the ability to, to get that information? Um, and right now, unfortunately, we don't have it in time to prevent it. Can, can, I, can I disagree a little bit with yeah. you? Because it is the coach's job to do it. Well, because they work more with our kids than anybody else. But I do agree with you on everything else. I don't know about throne being a legend and all that <laughs> I can come <laughs> but uh, but I, I do agree with every single thing he said the kids know certain people and they trust you if you've been around and you've been consistent you've been straightforward and honest with them uh, you supported them in these different things they do know who you are but you're not in the school so they, all through the winter, this is why I said we have to have boots on the ground all through the winter, they have beeps. And it may be on social media, it may be text message beeps, but by the time the weather gets warm, the thing that we lack is a plan. We do, we, we are notorious in this state, especially in Minneapolis, for not having a plan. We have everything we need in the community. I don't know, and we used all of that with Murder Athletes. We used all of that. We worked with the coaches, the schools, the churches, um, the teachers, the police department, community organizations, businesses, everybody worked together. But now in, in light of George Floyd, there I go saying that name again, but in light of that, we have pushed the police totally out of the picture and we have separated ourselves so that right now families tend to resource shop and that's something that we want to stop if if you can if i own the organization and he owns the organization and you came to me and said i keep using you i'm sorry oh, you got that's fine. <laughs> that's when i make a lot of <laughs> right so if you come to me and say hey i need five bus cars for me and my kids i said okay and then you go to him and say i need five bus cars for me and my kids i don't know you want to because we don't work together. We're organizations in the community, but we don't work together. So now I need to know 
what I need to do to help you move your life forward because you clearly didn't need 10 bus cards. That would mean you're probably gonna sell five of them. So what can I do for you to help move your life forward so that you're not resource shopping? And I think we've become a city and a state that is a give me, just give me, just give me, and we're not seeing a return on even that investment. So I, that's, I'm sorry, y'all know I get it. <laughs> Just a couple of comments from my past teaching days that resonates with what both of you are saying. Um, it's gotta be those listening adults that put themselves somewhere in the vicinity of what's going on. As you said, that person who had the kids coming in and, and wanting to talk to them. Um, I was a coach. I mean, you hear a lot of things in the locker room, and you've, you've got to have those listening ears. I mean, you, you're not eavesdropping or whatever, but I mean, you're that adult that's there, and you care about the kids and what's happening in their lives and being in tune to what's happening. I also worked with a woman who um, had teenage daughters. She was a single mom. And she said, you know, when they have their friends over, I make myself available and just kind of off to the side, I'm not part of their conversation, but I'm there listening, you know, to what they're talking about and what's important in their lives. And I look like I'm tuned out or I'm reading a book or, you know, what have you, but I'm there. And um, I've also heard from parents too that um, driving kids to events or getting them wherever they need to go. And I see some people shaking their heads. Yeah, you know, those are some of the opportunities that we have to look for. And it's hard when you're distracted, uh, when you're stretched, when you don't have the feeling of safety as, as a teacher in the school to feel like you can go out and do that. And I know it's changed since I was a teacher, but I think you bring up some really valid points about how we could, and it's, it's not big things, it's those little things that we are able to do and build upon. So thank you very much. Yeah, we're gonna have some discussion. We're on live stream, so we can't take your question right now. So write it down on the table, and what a great segue, because we're going to move to table discussions right now with what we've heard from our great panelists. And um, hopefully you can come up with some questions uh, there should be cards at your table, and Lindsay, Kathy uh, will be coming around to collect those, and in about 10 minutes or so, we'll reconvene um, to hear what you've been thinking about at your tables. And hopefully you've had that beginner's mind uh, so that we can come up with some new thoughts and ideas for our panelists to comment on. Uh, help yourself to the refreshments, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Thank you.